It doesn't matter what hell has declared upon you, your family, your children, or your children's children. When heaven starts it, hell can not stop it. Somebody prays like you know. Let me, let me share with you what the Spirit of God placed in my heart for this assignment this morning. And to put it in, in, a, in a 21st century context, we'll biblically substantiate this in a second. Many moons ago, there was a lady named Jezebel, and she tweeted. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> of course, as you well know, this is before Elon Musk took over Twitter. <sighs> and hey, Elijah, in 24 hours you will die. First Kings 19:2. Eli Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you as you have killed them. That's a de facto old school tweet. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. I want to juxtapose Jezebel's tweet, her threat, with what took place in 2 Kings 2, 11. As they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire had appeared. Drawn by horses of fire, it drove between the two men, referencing Elijah and Elisha, separating them. And Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 13. And Elisha picked up Elijah's mantle. I want to speak to you on the subject matter, the collective meta-narrative of Show Me Your Glory. Jezebel's tweet, the threat versus the testimony. The subtext is this. When heaven starts it, hell cannot stop it. I need you to touch the neighbor you like the most and tell him when heaven starts it, hell cannot stop it. Now touch the neighbor you barely tolerate and tell that neighbor when heaven starts it, hell cannot stop it. On one side we have the threat, on the other side we have the testimony. And I wanna remind you from the get-go the testimony will always be greater than the threat. What God has placed upon you will always be greater than anything hell can place in front of you. If you're taking any notes, and good luck with that. It begins when we are fully cognizant of the fact that we're living in a time, without a doubt, where the spirit of Jezebel and Ahab and Baal are alive and well. But we carry a mantle. That mantle is greater than the threat. I'm gonna repeat that for the hearing impaired. The mantle is greater than the threat. The anointing inside of you is greater than anything hell can send against you. I wanna repeat that coming out of this season. Melbourne, Australia, the anointing is greater than the threat. The spirit of God inside of you is greater than any hell that can be in front of you. The Spirit of God inside of you is greater than any weapon formed against you. Number one, that mantle, and I wanna just frame the mantle to give it clarity. It is, without a doubt, the mantle of the Spirit. Everyone repeat after me, the mantle of the Spirit. So we're juxtaposing the mantle versus the threat. The mantle of the Spirit. The power of the Lord came upon Elijah. He fastened his clothes around his waist. He ran. He had this mantle. Elijah had a mantle in 1 Kings 19, 19. He places the mantle upon Elisha. And, and then subsequently, we read it, Elisha picks it up when Elijah finally is taken up. L let me just, I am convinced and convicted that we're living spiritually speaking just like in the days of Ahab, Jezebel, and Baal. We are in Australia, in America, and all over the world, we cannot deny the following. Listen, Ahab, let me give you some background here. Ahab was a mucho malo hombre. The spirit of Ahab is alive and well, robbing love, killing joy, destroying peace. Ahab is alive and well, that spirit. It represents forces with access and authority attempting to prompt us to sacrifice truth on the altar of political and cultural expediency. The spirit of Ahab is alive. In 1 Kings 16, 34, Ahab was 
He was cuckoo. Ahab was the first king that ever gave permission for the rebuilding of the walls of Jericho. No other king in Israel's history ever had the audacity to rebuild what God knocked down. This guy comes along and says, I give permission for you to rebuild what God knocked down. The spirit of Ahab is alive. In Australia, in America, around the world, there are things that God has already addressed that the spirit of Ahab is trying to bring back up again. And, and, and I don't want to get mm, in, in trouble here, but that spirit of Ahab is truly made manifest as we continue to see racial strife and discord and ideologies permeating every single sphere of society for the purpose of dividing us in perpetuity because of the color of our skin. So Ahab loves to see us divided by race, which reminds me to tell you there is no such thing as a white church or a black church or a brown church or a yellow church or a red church. There's only one church, Australia. There's only one church, Daystar. It is the church of Jesus Christ. And the gates of hell will never prevail against him. Jezebel was his wife. So this man was bad and he had a wife and she was nasty on steroids. And the spirit of Jezebel was alive and well, persecuting, prosecuting, and attempting to silence the children of the cross. Jezebel represents a manipulative, sexually coercive, perverse, corrupt, cultural spirit, intent to kill the prophetic voices, to silence truth and construct Asherah poles in order to marginalize the oracles of righteousness and justice. A spirit that exploits the moments in our lives when we are exhausted. A spirit that according to the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 20, even good Christians may be guilty of unfortunately tolerating. For this one thing I have against you, you have tolerated the spirit of Jezebel. The spirit of Baal is alive and well, demanding that truth and children in and out of the womb be sacrificed on the altar of the false. If you haven't noticed, there is a spirit like never before coming after our children. There is a spirit coming after our children. There is a spirit unleashed on the planet coming after our children. But let me prophesy. We, our generation will not be defined. Our generation will not be the son. Our generation will not be defined by Ahab or Jezebel or Baal. Let me prophesy, planet shakers. We are about to see Elijah's and Elisha's rise up in the name of Jesus, and we will confront Baal, and we will declare, get your hands off our children. So here's a deep seminary endorsed biblically contextualized Hebrew exegetically substantiated phrase. Whatever that means. Found it on Google. Don't drink the Kool-Aid, which means do not conform to this world. I don't care what you're reading on social media, what you're watching here on your ABC or on BBC or, or CNN, don't drink the Kool-Aid. I want to remind you, that's why we're here. The most powerful spirit on the planet today is not the spirit of Ahab. I need the church to recognize this. We have to wait. get off your fetal position. Let the church stop sucking her thumb. Stop whining about everything. We're not victims. We're more than conquerors. Stop complaining. Stop posting your complaints. The most powerful spirit is not Jezebel. The most powerful spirit in Australia and around the world is not Baal. It's not Ahab. Are you ready? In 2023, the most powerful spirit is still the Holy Spirit. If you believe it, shout like you have that spirit. Praise like you have that spirit. Worship like you have that spirit. Preach like you have that spirit. Live like you have that spirit. For it is not by might nor by power but by my spirit, say of the Lord. The spirit of God is still moving. I'm gonna say it again, the spirit of God is still moving. I don't care if you deep platform me, I'm gonna say it loud and clear, the spirit of God is still moving. 
El Espíritu Santo todavía se está moviendo sobre la faz de la tierra Y no hay nada que podrá tener el mover de Dios Nothing can stop it Nothing where that spirit is present there is power I said there is power Acts chapter 1 verse 8 There is freedom 2 Corinthians 3.17 We are to be driven by that spirit Not by the flesh Galatians 5.16 We are to be filled with the Holy Spirit Not drunk with wine Ephesians 5.18 We are anointed with the Holy Spirit 1 John 2.27 We are defined by that spirit Romans 8.11 The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us. All the Holy Spirit people shout like you have that spirit. And cameraman, where are you? Give me a tight shot. I won't make this clear in light of what happened in the past three years. Not getting in trouble, just making it clear. There's not a legislative initiative, an executive decree, a court decision, a social media campaign, or even a virus that can stop the Holy Spirit from moving. Is anybody ready to see God show up? <sighs> you can't cancel the Holy Spirit. You can't deplatform the Holy Spirit. You can't defund the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot be stopped. Are there any questions? Real quick, I got to expedite the process. Number two, numero dos. It is the mantle of drought, fire, and rain. Somebody say drought, fire, and rain. So the mantle is the mantle of the Spirit. It's the anointing, 1 John 2, 27. New Testament. It's Christology. It's New Testament, New Covenant, application of the reality from an Old Testament narrative and completely elevated by the vicarious to Tony finished work of Christ. It is the mantle of drought, fire, and rain. 1 Kings 17, 18. The mantle embodied and represented a prophetic spiritual authority upon this holy man of God. It was his testimony. It was on him when he unleashed the drought in 1 Kings 17, 1. It was upon Elijah in 1 Kings 18, 38 when he prayed down fire. It was upon him in 1 Kings 18, 41 when he said, here comes the rain. Somebody say drought, fire, and rain. <laughs> this really serves drought, fire, and rain as an outline of a journey to a great degree, arguably, that each and every one of us must go through. Drought, fire, and rain. And let me ask, let not be, I don't want to be presumptuous. If you've been through at least one drought, emotional, relational, financial, physical, spiritual, if you've been through at least one drought in the past three, five years, raise one hand. If you've been through a couple of serious droughts where nothing was growing, where things were dry, raise both hands. If you've been through so many droughts in the past four, three, four years, five years, that you lost count how many droughts you've been through, raise both hands and a foot. <laughs> if you've been through so many droughts, that if I Google the word drought right now, automatically the algorithm will take me to your Instagram account. <laughs> we all go through droughts. All of us go through droughts. If you've never been through a drought ever in your life and you've been serving Jesus for years, please come up at the ultra card together because I want to worship you. <laughs> We've all been through droughts. But here's the thing. People want to jump from drought to rain without going through the fire. And the chronological order of 1 Kings 17 to 18 elevated through the life of Christ, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, really tells us it's drought, fire, and rain. We all must go through the fire to get to the rain. The fire is Matthew 3:11, baptism in what? In him water, Holy Spirit, and with fire. The fire season in your life is not what you think. The fire of God doesn't make us dance and shout and go, woo! The fire of God will get you on your knees in repentance. The fire of God is a sanctifying fire. It is a purifying fire. It is a purging fire. 
Be careful what you ask for. Don't you dare ask for the rain if you're not willing to go through the fire. Because the fire will precede the rain. The fire season is when God actually does a work in your life where he will remove the stuff inside of you that would have held back the fulfillment of his purpose for you. And on many occasions, he will not only just remove the stuff inside of you, he will literally remove people from around you that would have held back the fulfillment of his purpose in your life. So if you have been through your drought and you have been through your fire, I need you to put a smile on your face because the next thing coming to you and your family, I'm going to say this right now, planet shakers get ready. If you've been through your drought, Melbourne, and you've been through your fire, the next thing coming your way, hey, 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 the next thing coming, is anybody ready for this? The next thing coming your way is nothing less than abundant rain. Somebody shout, here comes the rain. Tell your neighbor, here comes the rain. Is anyone here ready for an outpouring from the glory of Jesus? Here comes the rain. Ezekiel 34, 26, in the proper season, I will send the showers they need. They will be showers of blessing. Deuteronomy 28, verse 8, the Lord will send rain at the proper time from his rich treasury in the heavens and will bless everything you do. Acts 3, 20, the times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord. One little side note, those that prayed with you in the drought deserve to dance with you in the rain. Number three, it is a mantle of speaking truth with love. So with this mantle, the mantle of the spirit, the mantle of drought, fire, and rain, the prophet Elijah came along and he confronted Ahab on top of the mountain. He looked at God's children collectively and said, today you must make a choice. Will you follow the gods of Ahab and Jezebel or will you follow the God of our fathers? One of the saddest verses in all of the Bible the Bible says that God's children said nothing. We call that political correctness. They said nothing. Let me lay out a quick rubric for you. Today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. I'll repeat that. Today's complacency is tomorrow's captivity. Number two, you are what you tolerate. In life, in your mind, in your relationship, in your health, in your circumstances, in your community, in your generation, in your nation, you are what you tolerate. Number three, truth must never be sacrificed on the altar of political or cultural expediency. Number four, there is no such animal as comfortable Christianity. Get over yourself. There is no such thing as kumbaya Christianity. There is no such thing as silent Christianity. No, no, no. Christianity, by its very definition, is the countercultural alternative narrative to the conformity of this world. So it's different. And number five, we must reconcile our eschatology with our missiology, which means what? Well, listen, this, in the, in the, I'm going to get in trouble here. In the 20th century, the church was so focused on getting out of here that we abandoned our God-given mandate to change the world around us. Because we were so involved in escapism, we abandoned our responsibility to be light in the midst of darkness, to be the greatest force for good on planet Earth. Do you really know who should be taking care of the poor? The church of Jesus Christ. Do you really know who should be leading the march for, for biblical justice? The church of Jesus Christ. Do you really realize who should be taking care of the addict and the homeless and the suffering and the widow and the orphan? The church of Jesus Christ. But, but we were so focused on we're getting out of here. Listen, I believe Jesus is coming down. But while we are waiting for Jesus to come down, Jesus is waiting for his church to stand up. Call upon the name of the God. You call upon the name of the Lord. <laughs> it is the mantle of speaking truth with love. We have, to, we have to activate this mantle in our current landscape by embodying Psalm 89, 14. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Truth and love lead the way as attendants. It's truth and love. Somebody say truth and love. If all we do is preach about love, 
we're nothing better than California hippies. If all we do is speak truth, we're mathematicians. The moment we, we speak truth in love, truth with love, and truth for love, we preach the whole gospel when we change the world. <laughs> but we can't be afraid. Let me, get a, let me get somebody here to help me out on stage. Where's Tim? Where's my partner, amigo, compadre, or Jason, or somebody... Yeah, somebody to help me out here. I'm going to do something real here. Give me somebody to quickly run up here and help me out. Just hold the microphone for me. Somebody who hasn't been raptured yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come on. You just breached every security protocol right now. But it's... <laughs> sure. Here, hold the microphone for a second. This is a book I wrote during COVID called What Heaven Starts at Hell Cannot Stop It. By coincidence, what we're sharing today. So... Just want to show you something here. Afraid of the dark. Here's a page. Afraid of the dark. You see that? Mm-hmm. Push your plow, meet your mantle. There goes that. The mantle of spiritual momentum. The speed of life. This book is now discounted. So we, we will be, I'm going to need your help. The mantle is speaking truth of love. My, God blessed the book and he blessed it and, and, he, and he did something great with this book. But the fact that I ripped pages from my book will do absolutely zero as it pertains to securing the advancement of the kingdom of heaven here on earth in these very difficult times. Let me have an old school Bible, which means a physical Bible. Grab that for me. Great. Holy Bible, New International Version. Let me do the same thing here. Ready? All right, when I count to three, I want you to shout, and I'm going to start to rip pages off from the Bible. For example, if we're, I mean, obviously, if we're not willing, if there's chapters that we ignore because they are so difficult to preach in the 21st century, if we're not willing to preach, it might as well rip it off. <laughs> if we ignore it because we're gonna, we're gonna get unfollowed and they're not gonna like us, if, if we ignore it because it's gonna, it's gonna stir things up, might as well just rip it off. So let me go to Romans chapter one, non-controversial. So let me rip, at the count of three, you all help me just shout. Let me get to Romans and you all shout and I'm gonna rip this baby off. Ready, at the count of three, you shout and I'm going to rip it. And then we're going to go through other chapters, especially in the New Testament, and rip them off. Yeah, because if we're ignoring them, why have them there in the first place? Might as well. At the count of three, are you ready? I'm sorry? You're saying no? <clears throat> then why do we live like some of the pages are missing? <laughs> Planet shakers, why do we preach like some of the pages are missing? Why do we pray like some of the pages are missing? Why do we act like some of the... If we are to see Baal and Jezebel and Ahab defeated, we have to preach the whole word and nothing but the word. So help us, God. We have to teach our children and our children's children that there is still power in the authoritative word of God. If you believe it, shout like none of the pages are missing. Thank you. Oh... <sighs> Lift up your hands. Lift up your hands. None of the pages are missing. Live like none of the pages are missing. Worship like none of the pages are missing. Pray like none of the pages are missing. Love and forgive like none of the pages are missing. Do justice, love, mercy, walk humbly before God like none of the pages are missing. Bring good news to the poor, freedom to the captive, healing to the brokenhearted, like none of the pages are missing. Lift up your hands. If I could get the band up here, unless they're in a union break. <laughs> Which could be, we don't judge here. It's the whole word. They're, let us teach our children and our children's children that only God can make something out of nothing.
Genesis 1-1, that only God could make a way where there is no way, Isaiah 43, 19. That only God can show up and restore the damage like it never happened, Luke 22, 51. Live like none of the pages are missing. Act, behave in action, word, deed, and thought in your relationship, privately and publicly, like none of the pages are missing. Elijah did that. Carrying the mantle in the midst of threats, none of the pages are missing. The word of God never fails, Luke 1, The heavens and the earth will pass away, but God's word will never pass away. And the true spirit embodied in the word, the word made flesh. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh. Like none of the pages are missing. Oh. With your hands raised. This really happened. He has this confrontation. Fuego. Rain comes down. Here comes the rain. By the way, do your biblical due diligence. The Bible says in 1 Kings 18 that Elijah heard the sound of a mighty rain. But then his servant saw something small. What you hear is big. And sometimes when what you hear is big, and what you see is small, prompt people to question. But Elijah acted as if what his servant saw was big because what he heard was big. Do not permit what you see to determine or to put a little what you heard. Because we walk by and not by 2 Corinthians 5, 7. So then Jezebel heard what happened on that mountain, how Elijah preached and acted like none of the pages were missing. And all of a sudden she tweeted, in 24 hours you will die. You will die. I want you to hear me. i got to wrap up this thing real quick here. This is what happened. You would assume for a moment that Elijah, Elijah just, he prayed for a drought and a drought took place. He prayed for fire, fuego. He prayed for rain, rain. You would come to the logical, coherent, reasonable conclusion that the moment Jezebel tweeted, the moment she made her proclamation, in 24 hours, you're dead, you would assume that Elijah would go, what? What? Are you kidding me? Dude, I prayed for a drought. He answered. I prayed for fire. Fuego. I prayed for rain. Rain. You don't scare me. You would assume. It's not what happened. The moment Elijah heard what Jezebel declared, he ran. He ran, he was full of fear. Theologically speaking, what's the phraseology? He freaked out. He just went. He abandoned his calling, his ministry, tried to hide. Solitary broom tree being fed, ends up at the side of a cave where God says, you know things are bad when God says, Elijah, what are you doing here? When God asks what you're doing there, you're probably not in the right place. Why? I want you to hear me. Because the real battle is between your mind and your mantle. The real battles between your mind and your mantle. The real battles between the thoughts that go through your head and the calling of God upon your life. The real battle is between your memories and your imagination. The real battle is between your past and your future, fear and faith, anxiety and anointing, drama and destiny. The real battle, the real battle, the real battle. How many know? How many don't think, hope, or feel? How many here know the battle has already been won? First Corinthians 15, 57. Aha, Christ is your victory. All right, stand with me. You are standing. Here it is. In 24 hours, you will die. 24 hours. 24 hours, you will die. Well, 24 hours passed. Elijah did not die. Are there any questions? 48 hours passed, in full disclosure, Elijah did not die. 72 hours passed, Elijah did not die. 96 hours passed, Elijah did not die. Jezebel said in 24 hours, I swear by my God's little G, you will die. She prophylied. 
It sounded like a prophecy. A week passed, Elijah did not die. What if I tell you a month passed, Elijah did not die? What if I tell you a year passed, Elijah did not die? What if I tell you a decade passed, Elijah did not die? What if I tell you a century passed, Elijah did not die? How about this? What if I tell you a thousand years passed? Elijah did not die. Hey, planet shakers, it's been about 2,800 2, years since Jezebel said, you will die, and guess who has yet to die? Elijah never died. He was walking with Elijah, 2 Kings 2, 11, when one day a chariot and a fire separated up, and a whirlwind took him up. He never died. What does that mean for you? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what hell has declared upon you, your family, your children, or your children's children. When heaven starts it, hell can not stop it. Somebody prays like you know. I tell you to lift up your hands. I'm here to tell you, let me prophesy upon you. Whatever hell has declared upon you, your life, your family, your home, your destiny, the opposite will take place. Oh, y'all missed it. I'm, what Jezebel said, you will die in 24 hours, and it's the complete opposite. The man has yet to die. And the matter of fact, he's not where he, hey, Jezebel, I'm not where I used to be because I'm not who I used to be. Hey! Do you want to know when's the next time we see Elijah? Anybody want to know? He didn't die. The next time we see him, he's taking a selfie with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Matthew 17, 2. I'm here to tell you to get ready. The opposite will take place. If Jezebel said, your family will never be saved, get ready to see your family saved. Lift up both hands. Whatever hell declared upon your health, the opposite will take place. Whatever Jezebel declared upon your family, the opposite will take place. Whatever the forces of darkness declared upon your ministry and calling and purpose, the opposite will take place. Which means the enemy will not have this generation. I said the enemy will not have this generation. The enemy will not have this generation. The enemy will not have this generation. This generation will usher in the greatest awakening we have ever seen. Somebody shout like you believe it, pray like you believe it, worship like you believe it. Because when heaven starts it, hell cannot stop it. It's too late now, you're, you're on. Heaven already began a purpose in your life. Psalm 138, verse 8. Already a purpose in your life. God will fulfill his purpose in you. His mercy endures forever. He will never forsake the work of his hands. What heaven started, Philippians 1, 6, he will finish the good work he has started. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, he who called you is faithful to do it. Hebrews 10, 23, rest in the certainty that he is faithful to keep his promise. If heaven already started something in you, raise one hand. If you understand right now under this anointing that what heaven has started, hell cannot stop, raise both hands. If you're fully aware by the anointing of the Holy Spirit and the preaching of the word, and the anointing inside of you, the mantle you carry, and the spirit inside of you, the anointing is greater than anything hell can place in front of you, raise them up a little bit higher. As you lift up your hands right there, here's the final point, I'm gonna walk away. It is the mantle for the next generation. Let me explain. Elijah picked up Elijah's mantle. Elijah's greatest accomplishment was not praying in a drought, praying down fire or praying forth rain. His greatest accomplishment was the transfer of his mantle to the next generation. This generation will receive a mantle that will equip you with the promise that when heaven starts and hell cannot stop it. I want to ask you, 
did Eli did did Elisha inherit Elijah's depression no did Elisha inherit Elijah's anxiety no what did Elisha inherit Elijah's what mantle put a smile on your face your children will not inherit your sins come on planet shakers your children and your children's children and your children's children's children will not inherit your sins they will inherit your man